I'm going to do one more quick test episode as a bonus episode where I read out the PR Bytes newsletter just as a test on this. Maybe I'll create a separate feed and do these differently from the interviews, or maybe I'll mix it all together. I'm not quite sure yet. Let me know if you'd like to reach out. You can always reach out to me, Richard Midson, M-I-D-S-O-N on LinkedIn. So here we go. This is Thursday, the 11th um, PR Bytes newsletter. And as usual, it is packed with lots of different tips and advice. It's got a uh, practice PR scenario in it as well. And I always round off with a bit of sort of headspace stuff, just stuff to kind of help people cope with the world of comms and PR as people, just to kind of how we actually deal with it, how we think about it. So let me read through the newsletter. Uh, so this is Thursday, the 11th of July, and it always starts off with uh, a motivational quote. And the quote is, if you know your why, if you really know your why, then the how will be obvious. Let's get into the main newsletter, though, and there are three key things that I think were the headlines of it. Number one was when you should attack the press, when you should actually go on the attack. The second one was the three ingredients of a story that engages people. And the third one was why do we still care about awards? So starting off, and this is who I've been speaking to section, and this is about attacking the media. And I thought I'd share a tip from a chat I had with Jim McCarthy from Counterpoint Strategies recently about what to do. He's in Washington by the way, in the United States, about what to do if you can't get the press on side, however much schmoozing you have tried. And Jim's advice is to go on the attack, and he shared some good reasons for doing this. My first reaction, I suspect your first reaction to this, is to think, if I go on the attack, then the media will come after me. Indeed, when you look at people like the Daily Mail, they go after people who've criticised them for years. Well, Jim points out that when you look at all the data out there now, and from his own experience, there's an enormous distrust in media today by the public. And if you come back at the press with hard evidence, and that's a crucial thing, hard evidence, then there's a good chance of gaining empathy from the audience who are happy to see the media be bashed, literally. Jim says he's coming at this, though, not from an aggressive point of view, but from a journalist perspective himself. So what he's doing is he's taking the idea of reporting on reporters' own biases and their flaws and pointing those out publicly. Now, there's a lot of context around this, and that's why I'm going to run the chat with Jim on the podcast over the next two weeks. It's a two-parter, and it's certainly worth a listen to work out when it's a good time to take the strategy, but it is absolutely fascinating. Two stories I spotted in the I Spotted section of the PR Bytes newsletter on Thursday. Uh, the first one was about engaging stories, and it was a quick tip on story creation I spotted in the Noisegate newsletter. Uh, in an interview, they were talking to a guest who referenced Barack Obama's speech writing and how it focused on three simple components. Number one, the story of self. Number two, the story of us. And number three, the story of now. Now, what that means is that when you're creating a narrative, the story needs to contain, firstly, how the subject of the speech relates to your listener. Why should they care? Why does it relate to them? How it relates to the context of the world around the listener to the wider experience of their world, to their friends, to what's going on in their daily lives that they see going on around them. And then thirdly, how it relates to now and why it matters now, that timely aspect of why you need to react to it. It's good advice, though, for narrative building those three, th three key tips. And the second item I saw in the I Spotted section was about podcasting for organisations. And I saw an article the other day talking about creating podcasts for businesses. And yes, I do have a few tips on creating podcasts. The firstly, launching a podcast, uh, I won't actually talk about what that article said, but I will talk about some of my criticisms of it. Firstly, launching a podcast is like finding a product's market fit. You never quite know who is going to listen to a podcast. There is no point in bothering with months of research. The key thing is to just launch something and then look at the data to adapt as you go along. Now, you may well find that some of your audience is not who you expect. At that point, you either need to tailor your content to those new people or if you're missing the point and not getting the people you wanted, you need to work out why your content isn't resonating with them. You know, one of the common mistakes you see is business podcasts that just interview the CEO or other figures where they just ramble on. And you've got to ask yourself, what is the value that your target audience will get from that content? If they don't get something personally, they're not going to listen. Okay, next section is take a PR puzzle. And this is a scenario that we've been running all week. And the question was this for, for, uh, for Thursday. This week, you were put in charge of the launch of a new urban mobility app. Unfortunately, the initial launch absolutely flopped, but you turned it around. You dealt with criticism from users, you dealt with criticism from reviewers who didn't like it, and you even had to deal 
with the launch of a rival app from the local government. It's the end of the week. So how are you going to spend those few hours that you have next week? And I give two choices here. As always, there's loads of things that you could do, but here are two choices to think about. Which one would you do of these? Number one, or which one would you prioritize is perhaps a better question. Number one, are you going to have one big media event which talks about all the different aspects of the app with interviews with the developers? Or number two, are you going to work on your community campaign to develop stronger relationships with members of the public who supported you this week? So are you going to have one big media event or are you going to work on your community campaign to work with members of the public? And I will get to uh, my conclusions on that in just a few moments' time. Still to come, though, uh, I've got the bit of headspace stuff to do, but also next is things that your boss might ask you. Once again, when I opened my emails this morning, I found a deluge of emails about awards, award winners, and ceremonies. I suspect you get this too. Why do they still carry so much weight when there are so many awards? And we rarely know much about how they're judged as well, right? I mean, why, for example, do we tend to see the same people win over and over again? Are they really that good? Are they really so exceptional? Why do we not hear about those innovative campaigns from independent agencies? Rarely hear about them, do we? Whatever the credibility of awards, they clearly still work for PR, though. People notice them. But why? I thought I'd have a look back over a series of previous awards over the past few years and look around some of the coverage that they got and what people were saying and this kind of thing. And I think, actually, you can boil it down quite quickly into a few key things, including one pretty damn strong psychological reason why they work. But let's look at the the basics first. First of all, they provide social proof. If you get an award, then people must have been speaking about you. If people are speaking about you, you must matter. We all fall for this. Social proof, as we know, is one of the strongest motivators in narrative building and communications. Number two, awards differentiate you. It may be simple, it may be crude, but not everyone has won an award. And so, however questionable the award organization might be, it still makes you stand out as being different to non award winners. Number three, it gets content creator attention. I know as a former journo, we looked for hooks and award wins were hooks. We didn't necessarily spend too much time looking into the awards themselves because again, it just gave us a reason to talk about it. It was easy copy. And finally, that psychological point. I did some digging around this because I was quite fascinated by why we still get attracted to awards. And I came across this term heuristic processing. And what this means is that as humans, we are lazy. We far prefer to have someone else do the work in validating what is good and bad for us because it saves us mental energy and it takes away the responsibility if we're wrong too. So the label of award winner is an instant, easy to accept statement that we're actually happy to adopt even because we don't even question the organization behind it. It's just easy for us to go, oh, well, it must be good then. So in conclusion, in other words, however many emails I get, and I suspect you get too, having a campaign to get an award uh, still makes sense, whatever the award. So if the boss is asking you to enter some awards, it might be worth it. Maybe even to create an award yourself with a wink on the end of that one. Okay, two more bits to do. What did you think of today's scenario? As usual, if you've got the time, I think both of those strategies would have worked. But my priority would be to go for the longer term one of building the narrative and building up with the community. You know, while a one-off event with discussions with developers could lead to a lot of social media and a lot of content that you could put out, it's going to be about the state of the app today. You know, that content is going to go out of date very quickly. Also, there's no guarantee that anyone is going to turn up. It could take a lot of planning to have what feels good, which in itself might be a good goal, particularly if you've had a tough week, but may have little impact. Instead, I would spend those hours next week developing that community campaign, getting people on board, educating them, and making them feel part of the app. That would be my approach. But what's your approach? What would you do? I would love to know. Um, You can always reach out to me, as I say. I'm on LinkedIn. Just reach out to me. It's Richard Midson, M-I-D-S-O-N, if we're not already connected. And feel free to ping me and connect up. Finally, then, the final section of the newsletter is always this. Chill out. What are you yelling for, it's called? Imagine it's late evening, and you are finally settling in for a quiet moment with your family. Your phone buzzes, and you feel that familiar pang of anxiety. It's another urgent request from a client or a media crisis that needs immediate attention. And as you navigate the whirlwind, the relentless demands on your time can feel overwhelming, leaving you drained and questioning your capacity to maintain a semblance of balance or normality to your life. But now picture a different approach. Try to remember 
that last time you scheduled a brief pause during your day? A simple coffee break or a short walk outside, even where you literally just walked outside the office or your home office or wherever you are and got some sunshine for five minutes and then walked back in. To try and recall that sense of calm and rejuvenation that even those few minutes away from the screen brought you. Just as these small respites can refresh your mind, incorporating intentional micro breaks into your daily routine can help manage that non-stop demand on your PR life. By compartmentalizing your time and setting clear boundaries, even if it's just for a 10-minute interval or five-minute interval, you might be able to reclaim some moments of control and mental clarity to help you cope with the long hours and uncertainty of the comms world. So that's it. I read the first edition of the PR Bytes newsletter. If you would like to get the newsletter, you can get it at thepublicrelationspodcast.com slash um uh, sorry just click on the newsletter button on there this is the last of these experimental ones i do where i read this this out if the data like i said with podcasting looks good if people are showing that they're interested in me reading out these newsletters then maybe i'll do it on a more regular basis that's it for today though uh I, i'm going to be releasing this oh gosh over the weekend so i hope you're having an awesome weekend or a good start to next week whenever you listen to this and i'll speak to you real soon bye for now